most of you know, is our deputy director, and uh, she's been really the host for these events. Um, the, this event is part of our long 2020 project, which uh, <clears throat> has featured uh, a number of panels this semester and which will culminate in a book uh, to be published by University of Minnesota Press probably in 2022 sometime, but that will still be the long 2020. So we're not too worried about that. Um, so we, uh, the plan of action today is that we will uh, ask each of our speakers to talk for about 12 to 15 minutes and we'll go in alphabetical order. I will do a very brief introduction of folks ahead of time. And then afterwards, we're uh, really lucky to have uh, my friend and colleague, Jennifer Johung with us uh, to moderate this discussion. And so she will handle that uh, at the end. And you're encouraged uh, audience to put questions either in the Q&A function or in the chat. And if for those of you watching on YouTube, this being streamed there, you can put those into the YouTube comment um, window if you have any questions or comments there. And I guess it falls to me to monitor that since uh, Maureen is off today. So I will take care of that and ferry in any questions I see there. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so our first speaker will be Daniel Barber. Daniel's an associate professor of architecture and chair of the graduate group in architecture at University of Pennsylvania's uh, Stuart Weitzman School of Design. His research and teaching are organized around two major trajectories. The first involves an archivally rich revisionist history of architectural modernism, demonstrating the significance of environmental concerns to historical developments in the field. The second involves providing a theoretical framework for architects and others to engage the climate crisis. His latest book, Modern Architecture and Climate, Design Before Air Conditioning, uh, explores how leading architects of the 20th century incorporated climate mediating strategies into their designs. Beatrice Colomina is founding director of the Interdisciplinary Media and Modernity Program at Princeton and professor and director of graduate studies in the School of Architecture. She's the author of many books, her most recent are, uh, include Are We Human? Notes of an Archaeology of Design, and also The Century of the Bed. Uh, and she's uh, the author of many other books as well, which you can find on, listed on our website or probably on hers. Finally, David Gisson, our third speaker, is a professor of architecture and urban history at the New School Parsons School of Design where he works at the intersection of architecture, history, and experimental design. Gisson is the author of several books, including Materialist Exploration of Architecture and Urban Environmental Degradation, Subnature, Architecture's Other Environments, uh, that's his, and also a history of New York City told through the design of the city's air, the Manhattan atmospheres. Okay, so I'm really excited to hear all of these speakers. I hope you are as well. And uh, I now turn it over uh, to Daniel. Fabulous, thank you so much. Just let me do the little screen share dance here. And uh, get us started. Sorry, I've got extra few steps. And I just, of course, this second got my little uh, internet speed is slow warning. So hopefully everything will, will work out. We'll hope for the best. You can see everything well. Uh, I hope great. Okay, so uh, thanks thanks to Richard. Uh, thanks uh, also in advance to Jennifer and to Maureen in absentia. Uh, really happy to be here amongst such esteemed colleagues. Um, I have to say the rich research of, of both David and Beatrice uh, and Richard have all been very influential on my own. So it's, it's really, uh, I'm very happy to be at this virtual table together. So I'm gonna extend the long 2020 sort of back a bit and uh, speculatively a little forward, exploring how the last year its struggles uh, has a past and possible future, uh, 
And to sort of do this in the context of schools and ventilation and, and the kind of conditions that they imply, somewhat emblematically, right? I mean, I won't be able to get into too much kind of uh, detail, but thinking of the classroom and its specific demands as this sort of charged interior environment that's gonna be kind of a specter uh, haunting my comments. Um, I wanna start then by, by mapping a bit what uh, I think we can call the politics of ventilation. Uh, my recent research, uh, pre-COVID that is, uh, has been concerned with how we ended up with the interior thermal conditions in which we live. So by thermal interior, right, and this kind of interior thermal conditions, I mean both the sort of uh, experience of the air inside, right, its temperature, its relative humidity, its qualities of health or toxicity, and also how we produce those conditions, right? So I'm using this term thermal interior to encompass both of those aspects, uh, uh, how we produce those conditions, in fact, through uh, quite uh, elaborate mechanical systems that uh, referred to in the field as HVAC or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, how these modes of production, the conditions they produce, have deep and complex resonance, uh, not only across comfort and public health in those experiential contexts, also around uh, global energy regimes, that's to say how the air we breathe in the inside of our, of our houses now, of course, most intensely, how that air resonates um, uh, given its reliance uh, in most cases on hydrocarbon energy across pathways of resource extraction, uh, the ecological decimation and labor exploitation that those pathways demand. So how this thermal interior has sort of hardened industrial supply chains, right, of the building industry, and, and then of course, uh, how these hydrocarbon fueled HVAC systems, such as we see here, also resonate, have ramifications and sort of emit, uh, uh, billow out into the atmosphere, the, the carbon emissions that are compromising our future. So again, trying to sort of map uh, this set of relations between the interior and its various exteriors, much as carbon emissions then are baked in to the atmosphere, as it's often said, right? Even if we kind of turn off the spigot now, we still have decades of uh, climate disruption in our future. In the same way, emissive practices are sort of built in, right, to our houses, our offices, our classrooms. It's difficult indeed uh, today to build anything, to renovate anything, or intervene in public space to imagine a life without these sort of air conditioned and heated thermal conditions. Uh, difficult though, we should note, uh, far from impossible. So I've been focused on this sort of conceptual and material relationship by, uh, by which this, uh, of this thermal interior and the global climate it, it relates to, right? Uh, and how they sort of play out into the knowable future, how we feel inside in the thermal interior, how that has a direct relationship to the prospects for the viability, the livability of the conditions outside. The time scales then by which the conditions on this interior, the ways in which it's produced, these modes of thermal conditioning, the fuels that feed them, uh, how these kind of time scales transform our sense of comfort, right? We might be comfortable today according to our air conditioned spaces, uh, uh, but it's, it's maybe a bit too simple of a relationship to suggest, but no less potent that the way we feel inside um, is also about how we will feel, breathe or not, right? About the kind of viability of the global climate in the near future. So buildings then, if, if you're sort of, uh, you know, playing along here, if, you, if, we, if we can still follow buildings then as energetic systems, right? As kind of spaces like these, this building, the Equitable Insurance Building in Portland, Oregon, designed by Pietro Belushki and built in 1947, um, often referred to, uh, there's other uh, models of this, but often referred to as the first building with a fully, seat, fully sealed curtain wall facade, um, which is to say these windows do not open, right? You were reliant in this space on, on the ventilation shafts, the air intake and, and heating and cooling that comes out of that, uh, of that system near the window. Uh, this room of which there are thousands, millions around the world, right? Uh, aggregating to form a sort of planetary interior uh, effectively sort of moving hydrocarbon fuels from the ground and into the sky, right? So these thermal interiors then as conveyors of carbon from oil wells to the atmosphere. So I've been focusing on these buildings uh, lately in the context of, uh, and perhaps still here in the kind of long 2020, uh, relative to Arundhati Roy's uh, powerful invocation of the pandemic, of, of a pandemic as a portal, I'm sure familiar to many here, uh, 
as she wrote a sort of rupture that quote, offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine that we have built for ourselves, end quote. So again, you know, quite directly framing this system of buildings, these energetic systems, carbon conveyors as these sort of doomsday machines of the built environment that we find ourselves with, right? Not exactly the ones that we need so I'm maybe not gonna quite get to the portal that Roy is pointing us towards, but trying in the end to, to kind of articulate a window, a sort of opening uh, something of a passageway or at least a glimpse of it. Um, so, so in this general sense then, right? In this general sense, this thermal interior as I've been trying to frame it is a space for political contestation, right? A space where architects might have something to say and do and think about in the long 2020, right? To think about the facade and this charged condition, this membrane that produces both the interior, again, the thermal interior and the climate and the global climate and our kind of possible futures, right? A horizon for architectural activity to reimagine the conditions of the facade as a mediator between thermal conditions for interior life uh, relative to climate instability, a sort of space that opens out into the future that might emerge. Uh, so I've been looking at these sorts of facades and their interiors, right? Uh, um, but not only, um, I should note, and I'll just play this out for a minute, not only looking at these sealed facades of the hydro of hydrocarbon fueled modernity, but also at the sort of dynamic interactive porous facades that preceded them or, or really were the subject of simultaneous innovations and interventions, parallel histories, buildings that are auguring a different sort of future. This is one of the best known, the Ministry of Education and Health built in, in Rio de Janeiro and completed in 1942. Uh, so pretty much the same time as the equitable building, equitable building we just saw. Uh, a period seemingly before air conditioning, perhaps kind of unevenly dis, uh, displayed around the world, but really alongside it, right? Here, when the facade was seen as a medium, as a mediator, as an opportunity to sort of correlate knowledge of the climate, of the diurnal and seasonal patterns of the sun, with the daylighting and thermal conditions on the interior. These uh, facades then, these types of facades, this other sort of porous type, are, are not uh, approaching or attempting the sort of normative universalism of air conditioning, right? Instead, as in this example, and we can see in this uh, sectional drawing, uh, uh, for those perhaps less, less versed in architectural uh, representational styles, right, this is in effect a sort of uh, um, sectional cut right through this sort of bay here that's showing what goes on in that window, in that facade and its thickness. Uh, in this example, sort of choreographing a relationship, right? Using the facade and its various components, its filters and screens, its openings and closings, some of which are illustrated here uh, as a sort of script seasonally adjusted, no doubt, a script that organizes a relationship between bodies and climate, between inside and outside, an architecture then that scripts a relationship between the life, uh, between our life and the sun uh, through this facade, a relationship focused on health, comfort, perhaps even what uh, Lisa Heshon called in 1979, uh, focused on uh, thermal delight. Or in any event, uh, rendering into cultural form some of these thermal practices, right? Modes of experience, ways of being, modes of designing, indeed thermal practices as a sort of set of concepts uh, something of an indication or a kind of instigation for a cultural focus of the coming age, how we design our interior spaces to have specific thermal qualities unconditioned by mechanical systems. Cultural spaces that allow for different kinds of thermal experience that open up to different socioclimatic relationships. So if the thermal interior is a space of politics of contestation, it is also a space of creative elaboration of reimagining ways of life, uh, collective life, reimagining how we might live in interior spaces without, or at least with less reliance on hydrocarbon. It's not a portal exactly that I'm describing. It's a screen, it's a kind of a por porous wall, perhaps a flue or a chimney. It's louvers and levers and hinges and multiple modes of opening and closing, producing a different sort of opening, right? A plethora of little gateways maybe. Uh, back to Roy's formulation, shading, mechanism in their, shading mechanisms in their interstices opening up as she has it, uh, perhaps uh, to some extent, quote, a gateway between one world and the next, end quote. A gateway then to build out, to build up a sense of comfort, of thermal comfort that is also taking into account the effects of these carbon emissions or even a kind of aesthetics, right? That considers not only pleasure or desire, 
the affect, but also how those experiences in the present are inflect, inflected by knowledge of the possible continuity of the species, right? A sort of integration of this uh, kind of potential uh, overheating of the planet into our sense of pleasure. Okay, so enter into this equation of interior and exterior of porous walls and portals, enter into it, um, oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to be, there we go. Enter into it an airborne virus, a, a new sort of politics of ventilation, or better, an intensification of the cultural performance of the facade, its relevance to our collective future. Uh, discussion on the viral interior was initially most animated around schools, right? But given the aerosol nature of the viral spread as it became clear, uh, given that schools satisfy what Zainab Tufetchi uh, um, very helpfully called the three Vs, right? A venue that is an interior space filled with people, uh, vocalization, classrooms as a space of talking, right? And ventil ventilation, again, our reliance on forced air. Mechanical HVAC systems, it turns out, left in an unadjusted pre-pandemic state, were here both a problem and a solution. And what this is sort of diagramming for us is that the precise placement of air conditioning units or ventilation registers is essential to their capacity to sort of clean out the viral conditions of the air. Uh, forced air can in fact produce, as, as Hong and Wang, uh, uh, some of the uh, um, researchers here note, Circula circulation zones called uh, vortexes, right? The aerosols keep rotating in this vortex. They're basically trapped, right? So this is not good. So it's to say that just turning up the ventilation can have the kind of opposite of the intended effects. Uh, nonetheless, regulatory bodies uh, suggested increasing air, take, air intake by 100%. Uh, this well-intentioned uh, kind of acceleration um, leading to potentially unwanted results. So just to be clear, mechanical HVAC can help diffuse aerosol particles, right? But it has to, to do so very carefully. The units have to be precisely arranged, uh, sort of targeted to do so. So the challenge that we're left with amidst these, amidst these intensifications is at least twofold. To thoughtfully manage ventilation through filtering and careful placement, to do so, one hopes, in such, as, in such a way as to not overly, not too extremely, increase the carbon load of these intensified systems. Which is to say that insofar as I have mapped, uh, just all too briefly, a parallel set of technological trajectories, right, the sealed curtain wall and the porous facade, uh, basically one fossil fueled and one not, that were concerned since the 1940s with the thermal interior, uh, the pandemic encourages, encourages us, even now in what is hopefully it's kind of waning uh, months, uh, out of caution, if nothing else, to intensify our social relationship to ventilation, to increase airflow into buildings. More fresh air intake, however, in effect, means increased velocity for conditioning systems to handle. Even when properly configured, this will dramatically increase the load on the systems. More air requires more conditioning. And in many American climates, a recent study by my colleague Dorit Aviv has shown, this leads to as much as a 200% increase in energy use. It's a sort of dark dynamic to outline, but in effect, more conditioning of spaces now uh, manages one urgent public health problem, the pandemic, by exacerbating another, the climate crisis. So two options again for the future of these interior environments, the extension of the long 2020, options to disrupt this technological trajectory of the sealed interior, uh, relying here again on the work of Dorita Vive, my Penn colleague and actually graduate of, of Beatrice's uh, program at Princeton, uh, in her thermal architectural lab, looking to non-HVAC means of maintaining thermal comfort. Here we see this all too schematically, the use of radiant cooling panels able to interact with the physiological thermal system and perform a cooling operation to cool surfaces and thereby the air that radiates from it, but not the air itself, right? So not free from hydrocarbons, uh, but less fuel intensive. And furthermore, significantly not dependent on a sealed conditioned space, but rather somewhat agnostic relative to it. Once we break that model, once we break the model of the sealed space filled with conditioned air, airflow can be increased by so-called natural ventilation or even higher speed fans, basically without necessitating all of that air to be heated or cooled given a radiative system. So first, encourage radiative heating and cooling. And second, if we want on these terms to see the pandemic as a portal 
within this limited context I've described, we have to rely more on natural ventilation, resist the urge now more than ever to over-condition ourselves. Instead, we can instigate other technological trajectories, open out to other futures by opening the window. Thank you. Release the screen. Okay, Beatrice, the uh, screen is yours. Can you unmute Beatrice? Okay, here. Uh, very good. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this exciting uh, event. I'm super happy to be in this center, which I uh, visited for the first time, I think, when I was in my 30s. Maureen sent me the other day a picture of myself with uh, blonde, a platinum blonde, super short hair, and I thought to myself, who is this person? Anyway, uh, pity that we cannot see each other in person, but I'm super happy to be part of uh, of this event, I decided to, to write about the, or to speak about this question of uh, modern architecture lying down. But uh, let me first uh, uh, bring you uh, some images of the current uh, uh, lawn 2020. Uh, what you can see here is a grid of empty beds in a dark uh, cavernous space that are waiting for bodies. Actually, you can talk about one architecture inside Another is a field hospital, a hospital that was set up uh, between days yeah. to accommodate 5,500 patients in a convention center in Madrid. So buildings that were, uh, they're still used, uh, well, not yet, but uh, designed to be used for temporary events, uh, now hosting uh, an emergency medical architecture. You can say a, a space uh, for the sea, so one architecture inside. The other, and it's of course not Madrid, but uh, we have seen continuously during this long 2020, uh, uh, it's also Belgrade or the Javis Center in New York and so many other uh, uh, situations. And of course, uh, another thing that is very important to, to remind ourselves is that it's a very, very old, a story, think about the parallel between this image that you just saw and the, par and the images that of these uh, um, spaces that for, for the sick too that were set up during the 1918 uh, pandemic. So again, temporary field hospital in these hospitals in this dark cavernous uh, uh, space. It's really very interesting to me that uh, 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 that each medical uh, event uh, is related to, to is, is kind of every time that we have a pandemic, we tend to forget very quickly. As soon as it passes, we completely develop amnesia. So only recently we have remembered the 1918 uh, flu epidemic and all the things that went uh, with it. But the important thing for me here, since we have such a short time to present, is to remind ourselves that all architecture, in fact, is sick. That you can argue, as this uh, fellow uh, did, that illness and architecture is actually the same thing. They are inseparable. Uh, this is Benjamin uh, Ward Richardson uh, uh, that argued that the beginning of architecture is the beginning of the series. In, in uh, this book, which is called Our Homes and How to Make Them Healthy, which in fact was a compendium of uh, tests by doctors and architects uh, for the 19, uh, sorry, 1884 International Health Ex Exhibition in London. And here you have some of the images and the plan of the exhibition and the guide of the exhibition and the kinds of things that are, are presented. He uh, writes there, and I'm just going to quote the last part of this uh, long quotation, that man in constructing protection from exposure has constructed the conditions of the sea. So basically there is no disease without architecture and no architecture 
uh, without the seeds. And doctors and architects have always been, actually, historically, you can go all the way back in a kind of dance, uh, uh, exchanging sometimes uh, roles, collaborating, influencing each other, even if sometimes not, uh, not always uh, uh, synchronized, right? So you can argue then that furniture, and these are examples of what was exhibited in this exhibition in 1884, rooms, buildings, but even cities are produced uh, and even equipment like the toilet are produced by medical emergencies that leave uh, layer upon layer on, uh, on the, over the centuries. But as, as I say before, we tend to forget very quickly what produced these uh, layers. We act uh, as if each pandemic uh, was the first, perhaps uh, it's a psychological thing. It's just we were trying to, to somehow bury the pain and the uncertainty of the past. But in fact, what I want to focus here today is on modern architecture because modern architecture and this we have done our best as historians to uh, somehow bury uh, this very obvious uh, uh, reality, which is the subject of my last book, which is called X-ray uh, architecture. Modern architecture was produced itself under emergency conditions. So throughout the 19th century and the first half of the, of the 20th century, millions, but millions of people were dying of tuberculosis every year all over the world. I mean, if you think about what it was worldwide, it was one in seven people globally were dying of tuberculosis in the United States. And there's a lot of empty space in the United States. One in five were dying for, of tuberculosis at the beginning of the 20th century. But if you went to cities like Paris, it was one in three. So you can imagine the trauma of that, uh, of that uh, yeah, generation. So modern architecture in a way, offer itself um, as a kind of defense against this invisible microorganism. You can say that, uh, that they are a kind of prophylactic against uh, uh, tuberculosis. In fact, uh, it's so remarkable to me how we have repressed this very obvious uh, 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 truth of modern architecture uh, that, for example, look at this image of, uh, of the most important journal, uh, official journal, not any avant-garde journal of architecture in Madrid, still in the year 1952, that just opposes precisely this image of the X-ray of the lungs with this uh, image of a modern building that turns out to be a, a sanatorium and, of course, uh, the sun. So this association between uh, modern architecture and tuberculosis, you can trace it all the way uh, in the writings and the images of, uh, of modern architecture. In fact, you can argue that all the defining uh, features of modern architecture, whether it's white walls, terraces, big windows, uh, detachment uh, from the ground, um, were presented as a form of prevention, if not uh, cure of tuberculosis. Even the exercise is presented as a cure uh, for tuberculosis. And by the way, some of these images that I just uh, so include, for example, the open air school in, in Ango, where the students, the kids are, are doing their homework uh, in the open air. And of course, the open air uh, school movement was a huge uh, movement that is now being recovered precisely in the face of, of COVID. That, uh, it started uh, at the end of the, uh, actually at the very beginning of the 20th century with things like the Berlin uh, Open Air uh, School, which treated what they call pre-tubercular uh, uh, children, uh, somehow bringing the kids out of their uh, families and into these open air schools in the outskirts of, uh, of Berlin, in Charlottenburg, in um, in particular, and there are a lot of things that we could talk about that, but we don't really have a lot of time. So let me get on with the program. So uh, the point here, I suppose, is the medicinal nature of modern architecture and the somehow unimaginable horror that it was responding uh, to has largely been uh, uh, forgotten. The image of, uh, of white buildings somehow whites out uh, the trauma that gave birth uh, uh, to them. Since we have very little time, I have decided to focus on a particular example, which is the example of Alto, uh, Alvar Alto and Aino Alto Sanatorium 
in uh, Paimio, and you will see very quickly why, because I want to talk also, address the question also of, uh, of disabilities in a way to relate as well to uh, uh, my colleague David Kier, who is going to talk about this before. Now, Paimio, uh, very famous uh, uh, tuberculosis sanatorium in, in Finland, uh, has these dramatic terraces uh, in the sky and even the building itself resembles uh, in canonical photographs uh, uh, like uh, like the uh, like the ribs in a, in a, in an X-ray uh, of the of the chest. So you can look at the clean um, uh, bedrooms, uh, uh, totally devoid of uh, ornament that were designed specifically so that uh, they were to minimize the surfaces where uh, dust could accumulate because that was the major obsession of that. Uh, uh, pandemic, no? The dust, uh, the obsession that the tuberculosis bacillus hide in dust, uh, it was the, the main thing. Even as you can see in the next uh, picture, the intersection of the floor and the wall beneath the window is carved precisely to avoid the dust uh, build up. And the rooms were equipped with, um, uh, with furniture and sanitary fittings that were designed also by the architects, including this chair, the famous uh, Paimio chair, that was designed so the angle will facilitate breathing and expectoration. And as well, the sinks um, and were designed to, to reduce uh, splashing, and the spitons were uh, to minimize sound, and even the door handles. Uh, were designed not to catch up with the not to catch the uh, the sleeves uh, uh, of the doctor's uh, white coats, but the uh, buildings uh, somehow main equipment was this top floor uh, terrace seven stories above the forest, where patients were wheeled out for regular doses of uh, fresh air and sun, in these uh, long chairs that are beautifully uh, designed by Aino Alto. And it's also remarkable that you can see Aino Alto uh, there, the architect of, uh, or one of the architects of the building and the designer of the furniture lying down on the, on the chair. So lying down precisely on the sick chair, right? So very different of the heroic uh, uh, image of the architect standing in front of, of their building. The architect herself as a sick, uh, fragile uh, individual. Anyway, this uh, terrace apparently I discovered a few years ago, well, many years ago when I went to visit it for the first time, it must have been also the 90s, uh, early 90s, before it was uh, 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 open to, to the public. And finally, I, I managed to let them in. Let, and, and they say, you could, I could not go to the terrace. I said, why not to the terrace? And I, I, they told me this strange story that uh, the terrace was a dangerous place because people could commit suicide there. And I'm like, okay, look, I mean, I'm from New York. If I wanted to do that, I have better opportunities. <laughs> and no, that didn't go anywhere. But when I went to the seventh floor, I just did the typical Spanish thing, which opened the door because they let me run the, the, the building by myself. And I opened the, the door and of course I could see the terrace, but it's a very sad thing to, to hear that uh, these patients that were there lying in, in the cold, imagine in Finland in the winter from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., like the same thing, the same timetable in Davos, uh, they at a certain point start uh, somehow throwing themselves off this uh, terrace every time a nurse uh, turned their back on them. Uh, the discovery and success of streptomycin, which was the first antibiotic that was successful against uh, against uh, tuberculosis somehow revealed that there was little scientific uh, basis for the air and sun therapy of the sanatorium. Uh, sometimes uh, the therapy even precipitated the end and at Paimio uh, quite uh, literally. Tuberculosis made modern architecture modern, and I mean that in the sense that it's not that modern architects made modern sanatorios, that would be the obvious thing, right? But rather that modern sanatorios modernize architects. And, and I give you again the example of Alto because Alto was a perfectly neoclassic architect before what he calls his conversion 
uh, to Funcionalismo uh, in the 1927 competition entry for a tuberculosis sanatorium in Kinkoma in Finland. It is, uh, is one of the drawings. This, uh, finally, he didn't win the competition. So you can see here in this project that, uh, that in many ways, these horizontal uh, uh, lines and white terraces in many ways anticipates what he will do um, in Paimio. For Alto, uh, the sanatorium was not architecture in the service of medicine, but integral to medicine itself. In fact, uh, an apparatus device as a means of treatment. Specifically, he says, and I find that, that quote very interesting, the main purpose of the building is to function as a medical instrument. The room uh, is uh, designed, is determined by the depleted strength of the patient, patient reclining in his bed. Alto uh, himself uh, had, and I know we are always uh, urged, or traditionally we have been urged as historians to eliminate all the um, kind of biographical details of, uh, oh, but I love biographical details and I think biographical details are very important and we miss out by not looking into them. So I'm going to tell you something that will throw a whole completely different light of Alto that maybe you didn't know. Alto was very sick actually, I discovered at the time of this competition and claim actually that having to lie in bed for such an extended period of time, he doesn't say what he had, but most likely it was tuberculosis because why would he be for such a, such a long period of time uh, in the horizontal had been crucial to his understanding of the problem. Architecture, he says, and I found that absolutely fascinating too, is always conceived for the vertical person. But here you have a client that is permanently on the horizontal. So he has this kind of beautiful drawings in which he uh, uh, illustrates the situation. And then he argues that the whole, of course, the whole design of the room and the building had to change accordingly, that life pictures cannot remain in the ceiling, irritating the eyes of the occupant that is now lying in bed and from whom the ceiling uh, all of a sudden has acquired a maximum uh, significance, a new kind of facade, I will say, right? The view uh, through the window uh, also to the forest outside has to be calculated also from the point of view of the person lying in bed. So for example, in the terrace, you have these low parapets and a very thin rail above, allowing the eye of the horizontal person to travel far away uh, above the, the for forest. He also talks about the colors of the, of the room and of the building that had to be thought in those terms, soothing, uh, quite dark hues of blue for the ceiling, the walls in lighter shades. He talks about bright canary yellow in the reception rooms by the entrance and in the linoleum of the lobby, the staircases and the corridors to evoke sunny optimism, even in cold and cloudy uh, days. Psychological factors were also to be um, carefully considered. An extended period of confinement, he says, can be extremely depressing for a bed ridden patient. Of course it is. Right? And then he argues, a tuberculosis sanatorium is to all intent and purpose a house with open windows. And I thought to myself, okay, yeah, that's kind of normal. You want the uh, hospital to be hospitable, you make it more like a house, right? But the most interesting part for me is when he turns it around and he says, uh, not only the hospital has to be like a house with open windows, but the generic house needs to be like a hospital. And he writes, I was able to discover that special uh, physical and psychological reactions by patients uh, provide good pointers for ordinary housing. To examine how humans uh, react to forms and construction is useful to use in experimentation, especially sensitive people, such as patients in a sanatorium. So basically the bodily and psychological sensitivity of the sick person was used to recalibrate uh, architecture. Even specialized uh, furniture became ordinary uh, pieces. If the cantilever beards uh, good paimio chair, for example, that I talked about before, was designed to open the chest of the patients, allowing them to breathe easier, soon enough this chair became everybody's uh, chair. And likewise for the rest of the furniture that had been specifically designed for Paimio. The altos right. The sanatorium needed furniture which should be light, flexible, easy to clean, and so on. After extensive experimentation in good, the flexible system was discovered to produce furniture which was more suitable for the lawn, 
and painful life in a sanatorium. Yeah, okay, so that's all very interesting. And a workshop was set up and a local, in, with a local company to carry the, the first experiments. Uh, the interesting thing is that two years later, um, this became the Finnish uh, contem company, furniture company, Artec. So uh, here you have Artec. So, and the ambition of Artec is to support and nourish human uh, uh, being. So the furniture that has been designed for this uh, patient has now become everybody's uh, furniture. But the point uh, here and what I want to finish with is that the reference point for the altos were the seriously ill. Alto even claimed that the architect has always to design for the person in the weakest position. And uh, in that sense, the tuberculosis uh, patient becomes for him the model of modern architecture. In other words, sickness is no longer seen as deception, but as the norm and barring degrees of sickness were seen to define uh, the human condition. The modern, su modern subject suffers from um, multiple ailments, physical and uh, psychological, and architecture is a protective cocoon, not just against the weather and other outside uh, elements uh, or threats, but in modernity, uh, 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 more notably about internal threats, psychological and bodily um, uh, ailments. Uh, and, and it's also symptomatic that I also compare his experiments in Paimio to the exaggerated forms of analysis that scientists use in order to obtain clear and more visible results, such as sustained bacteria for microscope examination. So he saw design as a form of medical research with the sanatorium acting as a kind of research lab for modern architecture, a way of testing architecture, looking at what has been uh, hidden, exposing somehow uh, the invisible forces. And this is another side of archi modern architecture that we tend to forget, which is super fascinating to me, which is really uh, the invisible client of modern architecture. Because if you think about it, Sigmund Freud, X-ray, bacteriology, and the germ theory of the disease were all emerging at the, in the very same very short period of time. And they are all about looking inside and how acknowledging the invisible, the unconscious, the skeleton, the micro element of the bacteria, the bacillus of tuberculosis. And architecture somehow is part of this, uh, of this revolution. It turns itself inside out. The threat is no longer outside, but inside in the invisible, in the micro scale of the bacteria that becomes the base for furniture, rooms, houses, and, and cities. So the micro and the micro, the bacterion and the city. The cities were suddenly seen as completely teeming with unseen occupants that in a same sense became the new clients of modern architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beatrice. Very interesting. Uh, so David, it's all you. Okay, great. I actually prepared two different talks because I wasn't sure what my, what my colleagues would discuss. So I'm going to share something that's um, a little bit more inside than outside. So, okay, let me um, let me get my screen shared here. Okay, hang on. Can you see that? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I want to share with you some work today on the um, topic of environment and impairment, um, and that comes from a, a forthcoming book of mine. Um, so um, the book is called uh, Architecture of Disability. It's in addition to being very frightened and um, spending a lot of time inside. It's one of the things that I did during, during this long 2020. So this is a historical and theoretical examination of how human impairment might be rethought um, within um, our discipline, discipline of architecture. And as, some, and, and as an impaired person, as someone with a, with a pretty serious disability, it's something that I wanted to um, write for a long time. And the events of this past year um, really gave me the opportunity and rationale for writing this. This image you see on the right is a photograph that was taken um, of me in collaboration with um, my colleague, Philippe Rahm, and it, through this thermographic effect, it reveals through layers of, um, of um, cosmetics and clothes that I'm missing the entirety of my um, left leg below the hip. Okay, 
So this book differs from um, a number of recent works on the topic of disability and architecture. Um, and chiefly, I question the way the politics of access has dominated the discussion of disability, architecture, cities, and landscape. And I find that this topic sort of elides a, um, a deeper and more critical spatial politics that disabled people might stage. So on the one hand, um, the almost exclusive focus on access in architecture um, engagements with disability, it, it tends to align the problems of human impairment with ideas about the human body drawn from functionalist and mechanistic philosophies. And I see this as ironic because mechanistic ideas and, and many functionalist ideas were actually used to invent the notion of disability in the first place. Um, additionally, maybe more importantly, um, I think a focus on access, a sole focus on access um, forecloses the way disabled people might create alliances and rethinking space and through any number of political registers. For example, I, I spent a long time living in Northern California and there's a lot of calls to increase um, uh, disability access into US wilderness areas. Well, you know, by contrast, I think disabled people might align their politics with people who imagine either alternative forms of nature conservation an alternative nature aesthetics that doesn't valorize um, athleticism. And finally, the politics of land restitution. So land dispossession is a determinant, a, a very key determinant um, of a person's um, ill health or impairment. So in addition to um, examining a kind of post access or a complementary um, politics to access um, relative to urban spaces, nature and landscape, the book explores the way that disabled perspectives might inform concepts about history ideas about architectural form, um, and even the construction and aesthetics of a building's tectonics. Um, these are many areas that are often left out of discussions of human impairment in architecture. So today I chose a small portion of a chapter um, and that I think would resonate with um, many of the things explored by Daniel and Beatriz. And I just have to say, it's real um, honor to be speaking with both of them and to be invited here today. So, what I wanna discuss are some of the ways we might rethink of the topic of the architectural environment and through a lens of impairment and disability rights. And um, like some other things I mentioned, the topic of environment presents some issues relative to a traditional focus on access. It's, it's difficult to imagine like how environment would relate to that concept of access because um, the constituent things of um, an architectural environment, air, ventilation, natural and artificial light and sound, they don't, easily align with many of the um, typical kind of topographic um, topics that emerge in disability rights and space. Nevertheless, um, the design of environments, of architectural environments, often aligns aspects of human experience and perception um, with programmatic needs and often very literal, uniform, and sometimes monumental ways. So among the, among the examples, um, we could consider the redesign of a lecture hall into an acoustically expressive form, a kind of trope of modern architecture. Um, if we weren't on Zoom, we'd all be looking around us and thinking I could help us think about this right now. So the kind of aesthetics of acoustic um, expression and which is dominant in creating spaces of let's say public or collective knowledge reinforces the concept that, that um, comprehension is fundamentally oral. I mean, A-U-R-A-L. One of the very simple things that disability might provide in a discussion of environment is a more complex understanding of the features that may be desired within a particular space. For example, some of us comprehend lectures through light because we communicate with our hands. Um, some of us walk well in a room that has better ventilation because we wear artificial limbs that generate enormous heat. Some of us see art when the temperature in a gallery is very cold because we touch it and temperature variation is one of the key ways um, to develop percep aesthetic perception among blind people, um, among many, many other examples. But I think disability and disabled people can offer more um, to the analysis of the architectural environment, ideas that extend beyond simply adjusting various parameters and features. Um, I believe the lens impairment offers might provide an opportunity to revisit the concept of environment utilized by architects altogether. Um, this includes revisiting what an environment is, how it relates to human beings, its inherent healthy or unhealthy qualities, and various alternatives to the idea of environment that have not been fully realized um, within many architects' explorations. So one of the th this is a, a big theme among um, scholars of disability, uh, the kind of normativity that I don't know if it's been it's been analyzed by some historians in the context 
of environmental histories around um, air conditioning, but we can further align it with issues around, um, let's say, disability rights. So one of the things we might consider is the idea of norm normativity and typicity at the center of the built environment. Um, this is something that um, Daniel touched on a bit. So architects and designers often use various guidelines and diagrams of the human body to design spaces as well as mass produced artifacts. You know, these diagrams guide minimal dimensions for space or the height of chairs among myriad other things. And scholars of disability often discuss how these um, ergonomic studies rely on a very narrow range of body types as their models. Um, and we can find very similar and parallel ideas in the development of the quote unquote um, architectural environment that we inhabit today. So one of the more famous of these experiments and guidelines, and I'm sure is well known to my colleagues here, were those created at Harvard University in the Laboratory of Ventilation and Cooling in 1924. Their young men were put in small air conditioned rooms with controlled ventilation. They had um, uh, anal thermometers to measure their temperature variation as they were being cooled and heated in rooms. And they conducted generally simple kinds of clerical work in these spaces, were studied by a team of observers, including people from the Carrier Air Conditioning Corporation. And people like Gail Cooper and Michelle Murphy have written about this history. So the goal of this research was to develop standards and that could be applied universally in the development of air conditioning systems and the design of buildings that house them. Um, and the study resulted in um, the development of the comfort zone, which is a parameter for indoor air that's approximately 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit when it's about 50% humidity. And as Daniel was mentioning, this, this, this um, environment, this um, production of mechanically produced air um, is almost is distributed almost universally in commercial buildings today. And it's most often delivered through forced air systems that control temperature, humidity, and rate of airflow. So one of the important aspects of the Harvard study and the idea of the comfort zone that emerged from it was that it advanced and ultimately um, instantiated what Michelle Add Addington calls the dilution approach to thermal regulation and experience. So here, um, comfort's achieved by constantly replacing the atmosphere that surrounds a person inside a space. And the term dilution just describes the way air is continuously um, replaced or refreshed by mechanically generated air. That's generally, but not always of a cooler temperature. Um, and the, this approach relies on the way that, that most people, I guess the, the majority of people, I don't know, generally experience heat loss through their limbs, okay? Um, and experience often odds with how people with disabilities who are aging, or even people who sit for most of the day ultimately experience warming or cooling. Now, Daniel's mentioned some of these, but this approach to how comfort is achieved and realized in space is been critiqued numerous times. Um, one that's probably the most familiar to you and one that's been explored today involves technical studies of, of quote unquote passive or non-energy intensive forms of environmental modernization. And this tends to, um, this tends to be the core of environmentalist discourses both in the United States and Europe so here, you know, we one an architect or an environmental engineer works with rather than ignores things like sunlight and the surrounding wind patterns to cool and heat buildings and to lessen the use of mechanical um, equipment. So the interior environment um, emerges more through site planning, let's say, than through technological devices. Um, one of the more provocative and related critiques is what we might call like a cultural or a geographical critique of uh, modernized environments. And so here, comfort and interior environments very broadly conceived are understood as things that can't be universalized. Comfort is seen as a, um, a cultural achievement, something in which someone might turn to fields such as architectural preservation and to preserve forms of, um, of um, climate control that are geographically specific and culturally inherited. Okay, so here, something like preservation becomes very important. And these are images from the architect um, the architecture of Hassan Fatih, a very important um, Egyptian architect. <clears throat> Finally, there are many other critiques of um, the sealed air conditioning environment and then emerge from outside architecture. So something Michelle Murphy, a historian of science has written about interests me very much is that in the 1970s and early 1980s, as office buildings in the United States became increasingly sealed, and ventilation rates were lowered to cut energy costs, many people inside these buildings began to develop respiratory and neurological illnesses. And it was really through the work of women office workers who were sitting in these cubicles 
that began to identify the various ailments that they were um, developing and working with um, industry developed the, um, the idea and a, and a fairly clear medical description of what became known as sick building syndrome, which of course many of you have heard of. Okay, so I'm very interested in what perspectives drawn from ideas about human impairment might add to these, um, this kind of more recent critical response to an air conditioned environment, something that very much complements um, some of the things that we've heard about today. So to bring this um, back to something you know, mundane, like the conditioning of space, um, one of the ways we can um, consider another critical approach to, um, to uh, the architectural environment is by examining the myriad ways that our bodies can experience heat and warmth, okay? So um, I can convey something um, from my own personal experiences, for example, that might interest you. So I, I actually cannot lose heat through my limbs when I'm still and in the manner almost all of you do because my limbs are covered. So I have to maintain constant motion to lose heat through the process of convection. It's very unusual, but it's very common among people that are amputees. So I'm very interested in um, how people like Michelle Addington, an architectural engineer who I mentioned earlier, and who about 10 or 15 years ago really reimagined the experience of temperature variation in space, not by rethinking architecture, but by rethinking the experience of the body at the center of that space. So one of the things that she discovered and that was actually based on a um, study from the um, US uh, military was that the back of our necks is actually um, a, an exceptionally sensitive area to temperature. If you've ever worked in a kitchen or something on a hot day, you put a cool cloth around your neck. So by thinking about new vectors of temperature, we can begin to like disaggregate some of the ideas about how temperature is maintained in space and by just rethinking our bodies. Now my, just for me to like, be interested in someone like Michelle's work involves, well, I don't have a lot of time, any <laughs> other ideas and, and critiques of what an environment is. I'm very inspired by um, people like Kurt Goldstein, who was very critical of the idea of, of environment and thought that it standardized the, the, the human body at the center of it. And he was very interested in exploring how people, uh, the patients that he was exploring as a neurologist experienced the world differently around them and really rethinking body environment relations in very critical ways. And I'm sure that's one of the pathways into Michelle's work. Okay, so you don't have to be disabled to understand that the architecture of the space around you uh, may not consider the ways in which you experience heat or cool. So for example, um, I'm a little nervous right now, so I'm turning red, but if I embarrassed you, you would likely flush with heat. Or for example, if you've experienced menopause, you know that the experience of temperature is not just a factor of an abstract environment around you. So I'm not saying a building should address these things in particular. I'm just pointing out that environmental action and the way that it's imagined in a building is actually very narrow. What I would suggest, and I think something that um, is quite important right now, is that buildings become sites through which comfort can be achieved in any myriad number of ways. And that we as architects, it's not that we need to rethink necessarily ideas about the envelope of space or the conditioning of a room so much. We need to figure out ways to disassociate the achievement of comfort and environmentalization from the interior of buildings themselves. So finally, I've mostly focused on the idea of environment found in enclosed interior spaces but I find that this general questioning of the environment body relation can be projected outward and into much larger urban questions. So the scale of the city also presents another political register to rethink whose body isn't represented in space and how, and it also entangles the idea of disabling environment with historical problems as well. So take sunlight, for example, many environmentalisms in architecture advance an almost uniform belief that increasing the exposure of space to sunlight is a universal good. Um, and almost all of us experience this in cities that have codes that tend to valorize the exposure of exterior and internal space to sunlight. This is part of a very long legacy, directly relates to some of Beatra's um, recent work as well. So architects like Henri Sauvage, Bruno Taut, the illustrator Hugh Ferris, they developed an entire historical narrative of the city in which the city goes from darkness to an intense sun-filled environment. On this diagram of Sauvage on the right, um, actually found by a student of mine at Yale, um, narrates how the history of the city is an ongoing progression from the dark, unhealthy medieval street profile 
to a sunlit, modernized type of um, terrace city. This is what um, we can call like the solarization of space. And it very much relates to um, combating tuberculosis in ways that Beatrice um, described. But the goal of solarizing space has actually been revived, <clears throat> even though we're not dealing with tuberculosis as much as we might may have in the, in the distant past, still exists as a disease, of course. So it's been revived by contemporary architects and who imagine how to carve buildings to intensify sunlight. And this is done for environmentalist reasons today. So on the right, you know, it reduces the use of interior sunlight. If in the winter, I suppose it um, helps with the generation of heat. So on the right is Jeannie Gang's, um, Jeannie Gang Architects' um, new solar carved building on the west side of Manhattan. And that is designed to completely eliminate shadow around it. And many cities, you know, um, have structures that would work in this way. But at the same time, many cities today are questioning this um, um, unquestioned um, um, intensification of sunlight today and in response to climate change. So let me just finish up with this. So this past year I was invited to be part of a research project um, based in Vienna, Austria and exploring ways to rethink heat gain cities. And like many cities, the solarization of the urban environment in Vienna is something cultivated through the city's modern architecture. Now, what made Vienna really an interesting case study for me is that it has the highest number of disabled people, um, both per capita and in general of a European capital city. It's a, a kind of haven for disabled people. It's where my and every um, artificial limb by a US veteran is, is manufactured. It's, a, it's really an epicenter of disability rights in Europe. Um, so Vienna also is experiencing um, very significant transformation in its climate. So let's say in the 1950s, you may have 10 days a year where temperatures reach 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now there are over 30 days a year where temperatures reach that between um, April and October. It has a very high concentration of disabled people, as I mentioned, very high concentration of elderly people and very young children. So from a disability perspective, or sorry, from a heat perspective, it has a very high population of vulnerable groups. So one of the things that we explored working with the city was how they're actually looking at some of the medieval arc, the kind of medieval urban core of the city as a way to deal with heat problems. They wanna move away from buildings such as the one you see here by Harry Gluck, which is this kind of terraced, solarized, radiant building and more towards things that are like this. I know this sounds very strange. So one of the more provocative ideas that emerged from our study is how the physical scale of certain spaces once deemed sickly a hundred years ago might be recuperated for planning ideas today. This is the type of narrow street that's typically dammed in modernist planning ideas, particularly during the rise of the tubercular city of the 19th and early 20th century. But these streets are remarkably cool in the summer and the air movement in them is actually much better than we realized. So here, disabling the concept of environment, um, which may have had a more technical sensibility in what I described earlier, involves bringing back a quality of historic space that once was seen in its in its, in its very essence as a form of impairment itself. And these are some drawings on the right by a student of mine from Yale, Yui Gang, who was working with the city to explore how to, to remedialize the environments of parts of Vienna. So to bring this to a conclusion, disabling environment involves loosening some of the physical um, correlations between our bodies and spaces that are built into architecture. It involves rethinking physiology in more complex ways in architectural contexts. It involved turning the environment idea off, if that's even possible, dis disabling it in another way, so to speak. And finally, it might involve rethinking the physical environment, um, sorry, the physical legacy of the environment in cities today. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> those were really rich talks with a lot of interconnections. Um, but I will leave it to uh, my friend Jennifer to draw some of those out. Uh -huh. So it's yours, Jennifer. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I do see one question in the Q&A um, and I will give everyone else some time either to put their questions again, you write them in the chat or write them in the Q&A. I just thought I would um, talk about some things that thread through all three of your really interesting and thought provoking perspectives on the state 
of architecture and design this long 2020, and then we'll turn it over to anybody who has questions. So again, put it in the chat, q and I guess Richard also with the YouTube. So, um, so one thing that I was thinking about for all of them, of course, is this recalibration that you were all talking about between separation, protection, architecture as, as this boundary place that keeps people in, but keeps elements and other kinds of people out. Um, and, and what we're seeing and what we have seen, I think throughout all these talks is pushing it not just to, oh my gosh, the pandemic happened, now we're rethinking it, but that actually architecture has always been rethinking what this boundary means and how we keep moving back and forth between non-porous separation, porous separation. Um, now what we're seeing, of course, you know, with all that's been happening the last year or so, is this recentering again of discomfort, disease. Um, and so I wonder, all of you have different perspectives on this um, about how we might try to think about to rehabilitate discomfort um, in the face of the long 2020 of what we can see um, by looking at the early 20th century, what we might be able to imagine going into the 20, you know, longer 21st century um, in terms of rethinking and again, recalibrating, recentering other kinds of things. If what we're seeing now is that porousness is necessary, a rethinking, um, as David was saying, about the normativity of bodies, which bodies, whose bodies get cured, cared for um, in this new world, um, and how we might drop or sidestep. We need to be comfortable, we need to be clean, the air has to be pure. Um, so I, th I guess I, I will just <laughs> let any three of you <laughs> pick up on any of those things. There's just so many yeah, things that, are, that have been going through my mind with you know, the practical steps of dealing with our own bodies, the specificity of our own bodies um, in this new uh, time. I'm so. curious, why do, why do you think that, um, why do you think comfort has to be abandoned as a concept? I know that's something that Daniel's written about as well. But. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, and I think I, I leave that up to you. Uh, For me, it's it's um, a rethinking of of what that would look like, and maybe that comfort is discomfort um, that we have to, you know, when we think about things like dealing with long haul COVID, we think about the, you know, in the near future having multiple. This is horrible. I don't even want to, <laughs> you know, but new coronaviruses. The fact that we can't cure um, things that we're now caring for things. Uh, so you know. I think about things like problems of overcrowding in different areas. Um, yeah. in, in Daniel's talk, I was, you know, thinking about how certain schools could open because they had less students, and so they could open more windows. And this is, you know, they had systems versus other schools um, in the city of Milwaukee, for example. You know, Milwaukee public schools didn't open until most recently to in-person students. So, yeah, I, I wonder about this scale of what we think about as comfortable i mean i maybe i shouldn't speak because i just spoke but because um you know i'm i'm warmed up um <laughs> yeah. oh. i uh i i do the more i work on this particular um study that's part of this larger study around environment i i do i do have the belief that that a, a quote unquote progressive environment in architecture might, 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 might be this disabling environment. Again, the second meaning, which means like archi an architecture architects who figure out a way to um, not instantiate a uniform or monumental idea about environment in buildings. I, I, well, the more I was writing about this, the, the, um, the approaches that I used to really appreciate, let's say the, a kind of bioclimatic or environmentalist approach was beginning to frighten me as much as a mecha mechanical approach. And I do wonder and reflecting on the long 2020, I do, I do wonder and I do see the way that like when people come to my apartment and they have various comfort levels around um, exposure, they open windows, they, some put on masks, some sit across. So understanding the way a building can um, represent multiple and often conflicting ideas about environment, I think is something that um, would probably become much more convincing moving forward. I mean, from like an architectural theory point of view, I realize there's not a historical idea in what I just said. And so buildings that don't do that have become somewhat monstrous to us lately. We feel um, uniquely exposed and vulnerable in them. So um, yeah, I, mean, I think there's a, a very powerful way to reflect really on that. I really like the term you used, David, um, myriad buildings as spaces of myriad comfort, or at least that's how I wrote it down. Um, right, right. 
And, and, and I think you're right, you know, and, and, I, and I think it is maybe a, both a historical and an architectural idea, you know, which is in part to say that one of the things we, we note across this history is that um, one of the kind of intentions and effects of, of modernity in the architectural context was the sort of delegitimation of so many customary practices. I mean, you showed Hassan Fati, for example, right, of so many different methods and mechanisms and materials and systems and habits and practices, right, that, that going on for centuries that allowed for uh, an experience of comfort that, you know, that many of which would not meet contemporary ashray standards, right, many of which would, again, be de delegitimated in our current context, but that nonetheless are perfectly viable, right? So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been sort of playing with this question of, of, of discomfort, but I think it's more as a kind of polemic to open up that spectrum. Right, and, and suggest as, you know, across thermal, and, and I really appreciate David's uh, intervention and in, in kind of expanding that beyond the thermal quite, quite uh, dramatically and, and effectively. Um, yeah, to kind of recognize the spectrum and, and one can kind of find oneself on it in different ways, right? And, and that spaces, as you suggest, can be built to accommodate the complexity of it rather than the normativity of it, right? I think that's the real issue here is this disruption of some sense that there's a universal model that needs to be kind of pursued at all costs, so to speak. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, we all experience this on you know, an everyday basis in architecture or not in architecture. Everybody knows that the difference between uh, a woman or a mine experiment, the changes in temper temperature are absolutely ridiculously different. Like uh, I read recently, I studied that uh, women are, are able to detect a difference of uh, one degree and, and it will take a man to, I mean, in general, these are kind of, uh, but uh, you experience that, that all the time, every time you're around somebody say it's hot I say no it's not hot and you say it's cold it's okay. you, are, you are like a like the canary in the mind but I tend to be I tend to be right in my building I'm the first person to say that the heating has broken down before anybody says it's cold I already can tell right so different people react different differently but I enjoy very much both your your talks uh, David and, and Daniel and I also very much appreciated this idea of the myriad uh, comfort and even the um idea that uh, Jennifer was uh, was uh, putting forward of recalibration, recentering, rethinking. And that goes back also historically, because, you know, I mean, again, going back to, to you know, the whole of modern architecture in general uh, has been designed for this universal man. And it's not just an accident that I say man. I mean, all these manuals of, uh, we did our study with our PhD, with our students at Columbia and at Princeton, in which we went through all the manuals of Neufer. And at the beginning, it's only this man, that it's a real man and it's a really athletic man. And it takes them a long time to bring a woman, you know, half of the population, for God's sake, nothing, no, don't exist. And finally, they bring a kid and then all of a sudden, there is someone with a wheelchair and it's, you know, years pass before they start accepting. And the same with all these uh, things. But in Alto, I saw, and that's why I wanted to bring uh, these architects up, the idea that you have to design for the person in the weakest position, because it seemed to me like this is like the road not taken in, in architecture. Because of course, we are all, uh, as uh, David uh, also uh, say in some way, uh, disabled, all of us, at, at least for parts of, of our life, significant parts of our life, our life, when we are babies, when we are very old, when we are sick, when we break our leg, when we, when we have all kinds of uh, debilitating uh, illnesses. It's uh, unbelievable that, <laughs> that this generation thought that they could design for this perfectly athletic man of 175 that uh, lifts weights and, and, and all of this. But there is also these other guys that we didn't think so much and they have become kind of marginal in, in architecture, that they were proposing a different idea. And this concept that architecture is always designed for the person in the vertical position, I thought this was really incredible because uh, I mean, if anything, you could say that the whole of the 20th century, uh, uh, we are in the, the subject is on the horizontal, whether it's the divan of, uh, or, of, uh, of Freud or the, or the chair of the tuberculosis uh, patient. So it's the, it's the century on the horizontal in a, in, in a way. And, and there is this contradiction uh, uh, there. Okay. And, and what can, can be happening right now is also very interesting because of course, David brought the question of the sick syndrome building. The sick syndrome building is exactly the result 
of the efforts to protect against tuberculosis. So every age has its own obsessions and uh, the age of modern architecture was tuberculosis. And then what uh, this architecture produces the six syndrome building uh, precisely. Right? And the obsession with solarization and all these things that David also brought, okay, there's a whole generation that grew up in those years in which it was so great to be in the sun all the time, that now goes around like, is this bad or is this melanoma or should I check this out? I mean, we produce a whole epidemia of, uh, of a skin disease, right? Uh, with this uh, architecture, so solarization is good up to, up to a point, right? So every, and right now, uh, actually, there's already huge speculation in which this money of cleaning everything with these antiseptics, we have actually seriously affected the microbiome of uh, or, or microbiome and the new diseases uh, will be emerging out of this disaster. Okay, so this is obvious. I mean, too much cleaning is not good either, right? We need bacteria. Bacteria has been with us for billions of years and we are only a bag of bacteria and we depend of, on it and we shouldn't be like with uh, all this arsenal of, uh, of arms against, uh, against bacteria because we depend on it to, to survive. Yeah, yes, I was, uh, when you showed the image of the Petri dish, I was like, bacteria, we need it. <laughs> Don't get rid of it. Um, okay, yeah, yes. thanks. And of course, I, I, you know, I could go on. The fact that more, this, you know, Built, certain sick buildings make certain kinds of people and communities and particular areas and environments more sick than others. Obviously, we've shown, you know, if if the if the long twenty twenty has shown us anything, is at the level of inequity, of course, in terms yeah. of who gets sicker, where they get sicker, how they get sicker, um, you know, and who can get spaced out in these larger spaces, who you know, and who just has to be forced to stay at home with, you know. Uh, extended family. Um, okay, but anyway, we do have two anonymous attendees who have put questions in the Q and A, and so I should uh, read those out. Um, the first one is has to do with uh, mental health. So the question is, how does the way we design affect our mental health, and how might that be included in, in say, David's research on disability? Obviously, mental health being such a huge issue that's come to the fore. Um, well. I don't know how I'm going to connect this. Let me think about this. Um, in that book project, I do write a lot about the experience of trauma, um, particularly around um, issues around the preservation of historic sites. But in terms of environment, as I mentioned earlier, one of the people that I've just I really never read before, who um, was writing 100 years ago, also incidentally taught at the New School for a brief brief time, was um, this person, Kurt Goldstein, um, Stein, sorry, um, and who studied um, World War I um, uh, uh, war wounded, um, people that had very serious traumas and, and mental illnesses from their war experiences. And his, his critique or his idea of a more heterogeneous environment actually emerged from those studies. And what he discovered was that by studying people that had these mental or these cognitive and mental impairments, one of the things he noticed was that they responded and these patients, res people responded in ways that couldn't be predicted by the experiments that they were staging in his clinic in Germany. And that they, what he argued was that they were constructing or debating the reality of their own environment themselves, which I thought was fascinating. And architects know him because Goldstein um, inspired two um, French um, writers. Um, in fact, one could argue that their ideas are very much based in his. One is um, Georges Canguien, and the other is um, uh, Merleau Ponty. And both of them draw a lot on Goldstein's ideas. But all of this came from thinking about how people with um, with, with mental illnesses, I guess you could say for sure. Um, the way that they could construct worlds outside the world that um, Goldstein himself could imagine. So super inspiring stuff, mm -hmm. you know, a total non, um, a non rehabilitative uh, model in terms of the medicalization of somebody who has a different mind than us. Yeah. Right. Yes, and, and you know, for me also one thing that went across all your talks is the difference or, or how we're thinking about curing versus caring, obviously both in terms of medicine, as well as in terms of design, um, historically, as well as in the, in the current moment. So um, yeah, that- And just gotta say one thing, this really connects yeah. with some things that Beatrice has been working on lately and also Daniel. Um, I do, you know, this idea about mental health, it's, you know, there was this article in the Times today that Beatrice, I think, was referring to, I think that's what she was referring to, um, about how we need to get used to, like, having bacteria and germs and our, and viruses in our life again for our own health, and so, you know, I do wonder how, like, you know, architects, 
in ways that I would be very critical of made us feel maybe a little bit more comfortable in the in New York City in the years immediately after 2001 in ways, of course, that we're all very critical of. But architects found a way to negotiate a kind of um, city in which terrorism is going to become a real reality. I do, and we were talking earlier um, before the conversation began about how architects, well, architects, builders have created spaces for us to have some semblance of a social life during COVID with places to eat outside or to socialize. So I do wonder how architects will negotiate people's way back into spaces together. That is something that we didn't really talk about much today. I wonder how they'll do that. Yeah, that is a mental yeah. health issue. You know. There is, definitely. And there is uh, some talk and, you know, again, I've seen this uh, in multiple articles of uh, kids that uh, has, uh, you know, relatively young, young kids that now are afraid of, uh, of going outside and they don't want to go and see their, uh, or do, they don't want to go to the playground and they're afraid to go to school and they don't want to go to school anymore. They have become comfortable with the idea of attending a school at home with a screen. And, and this, is, of course, creates all kinds of uh, 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 questions about how to. But of course, for modern architecture, mental health was very important. Neutra, for example, first was obsessed with tuberculosis, and the house was a way to prevent tuberculosis. And as soon as streptomycin was here, all of a sudden, Modern architecture, without changing that much, was perfect for your mental health, right? It was uh, like the architect was a shrink, and the and the house was a was a, was a kind of therapy, a mental therapy, to make you you know um, healthier mentally. Can I kind of take this from a slightly different direction, and it goes back more directly to the question around discomfort? I mean, I, I think that again, you know, one of the the kind of shared um, revelations across our presentations uh, today that was so compelling was this sort of negotiation of normativity or these sort of universal conditions that we all have recognized as, you know, having been one of the projects, certainly of the emergence of modern architecture and, and you know, an issue which maybe whose time has passed. And, and, and so I, I think that I'm also thinking, getting uh, maybe pre preempting the next question a little bit that's in the Q&A, um, that, that sort of ways, how do we, again, the sort of question of how do we um, you know, bring in the kind of externalities of future people into our experiences of comfort, our experiences of health and security, and you know, be they mental health or or otherwise, which is which is in part to say, how do we sort of begin to imagine a, a way of understanding how our experiences resonate across, you know, the various forms of whether it's carbon accounting or or, or forms of climate disruptions that we're also kind of participating in, right? And, and how much are we, you know, producing our instability while we're kind of securing our normativity, right? I think is uh, something that, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm straining it a little bit to bring it directly into mental health, but it's it's maybe, you know, I've been reading a lot about this kind of emergence of climate anxiety, right, which I certainly, uh, you know, it hasn't been diagnosed, but it's something that I, I certainly feel prone to myself and, and how to uh, find a space, a kind of peace and sense of a possible future in the context of, you know, the sort of barrage of knowledge of, of its inevitable um, uh, disruption, right? So that seems to have a something of a threat across these issues as well. It may be worth to go back to, to, to the questions of, com of how comfort has changed, the ideas of comfort has changed to the center. I'm just reminded my, right now of Walter Benjamin to, talking about the change of, uh, of the idea of comfort in the, in the 19th century and, and when he talks about the mats and all of these uh, things. So I think mm -hmm. our ideas mm -hmm. of comfort have uh, changed uh, radically. So this is a very long uh, a story. It would be interesting to see how our ideas of comfort have changed after after uh, COVID. What do we think is comfortable now? Going back to our pre-event uh, discussion about eating uh, in the freezing uh, cold outside in the restaurant and being happy about it. Because the reality is that we put ourselves daily uh, in situations of extreme discomfort and we do it voluntarily which in so many situations, including our work. I mean, why would we kill ourselves the way we do, right? I mean, that's like, is it masochism or what is, and you know, extreme sports, uh, being outside in the, I mean, like all these things that we do, I mean, that also produce pleasure. So comfort is comfort, you know, those things are always in some kind of dialectic kind of relation. Right? 
Yes, and this might be a good time to end with this personal question that you will probably see in the Q&A, which is, um, this is a speaker or a, an attendee who feels comfortable in their own home, they open the windows, go for regular hikes, um, like Corona has thus far had little effect in how they feel about their own personal space. So the question is, do, do you, each of your speakers, or I guess how, you, how do you personally feel discomfort or unsafe if you do in your own homes? Of course, you feel comfortable at home. I mean, but I mean, I, I, I'm reminded of what you say, Jennifer, about how this pandemic has affected all of us in such different uh, uh, ways. And I really uh, uh, have to say that this is the most dramatic thing that has become um, the invisible city is what has become obvious in this moment. The invisible city of all these hidden workers that are have been uh, during this pandemic obligated to get on the subway, to get to work, to clean a hospital, to clean who knows what uh, in the middle of this pandemic. They don't have the the uh, the, the luxury of uh, of working at home. Like we we are the privilege. We at least have a roof over our heads. That's a huge privilege already in this country where so many people don't have anything that they can call a home, right? And, and, and so, you know, these questions are always a bit uh, com complicated. Right. Others? Yeah, and I think this, again, the question of comfort and how it resonates, right? I mean, I, I had a little joke. I mean, I guess it was now two summers ago in, you know, a hot Philadelphia August with a colleague of mine in Baltimore, how long we could go without air conditioning, basically, right? Which was not really that long. And, 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 you know, and the jokes that we were making was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm too hot, I'm too sweaty, I can't get any work done. You know, it's like, okay, I mean, again, back to this kind of question of, of who benefits and who doesn't, like, if a tenured Ivy League professor can't get some work done, like, maybe that's okay, right? If I'm saving enough carbon, can I give it to, you know, a junior colleague who needs the air conditioning to, you know, finish their book or something, right? I mean, how can we sort of negotiate these kind of comfort conditions in such a way that, those of us who can, can manage the discomfort, uh, and again, I tend to think in thermal terms, but one could expand this out, um, can, you know, can, can sort of go without or certainly reduce demand, right? Uh, either to just emit less, right? Or just to sort of redistribute uh, some of our capacity to condition and to kind of feel comfortable, right? Uh, to some of those who might benefit from it at you know, the greater magnitude than those of us yeah, sitting at home comfortably. Um, okay, David, unless you would like to share your own feelings of comfort. No, I, can, I, um, I really appreciate what both of them said. I, I really appreciate what Beatrice said about the people in New York City that are taking such enormous risks. I mean, the only other perspective that I can provide and that comes very much from my talk is, um, is that um, the small kind of um, disability arts community that I, that I know here, one of the things that people have said is that as things quote unquote return back to normal, there's there's something that they're going to miss, which I know sounds like a maybe an enormously privileged thing to say, but that thing they'll miss is the sense of impairment that hovers over the city. So people know, I don't necessarily feel this way, but the way that some people feel all the time. And that when the city, basically in New York City, when New York City emptied out people that had the, the means to go somewhere else, that all of a sudden the city became habitable for a way, a way in a way for them that it never was before, which was fascinating, something I never thought about. Um, so there's all kind again, there's all kinds of perspectives in terms of who's feeling at home right now and why. And, and I, I very much agree with what Beatrice said. It's like, you know, I have no idea what it's like to have to leave home every day to work and constantly expose yourself to disease right now. It's just, you know, it's horrible, obviously. So something we should all appreciate. So yeah, I wanted before we go to just add that what struck me so as so interesting about these talks was to think about a kind of analogy or parallel between built environment and bodies because we've talked a lot about what kind of body built environments are for but and Daniel's talk about you know the climate and the exchange of air from inside and outside made me realize that this is also precisely the crucial problem with our bodies during the COVID pandemic is how to keep, how to control the climate, so to speak, inside the virological climate and our bodies with things like masks and other forms of prosthesis become in a way, 
small mobile built environments, even to the point of Beatrice, the, you know, the little places you eat outside where some restaurants are putting up individual table pods and it becomes this weird kind of thing between a, is it a building? No, is it your body or your extended body? You know, what is that? And I think that that's a really interesting area of sort of, of thought to think about, you know, architecting the body in the pandemic and how we've always, I think, been involved in, in that kind of architecture as well. So it's not just for the last question, how comfortable are you in your home, but it's kind of become how comfortable are you in your own skin and not in the <laughs> traditional way of, oh yeah, I'm just, you know, easy, but rather, you know, is this a place that is protecting me in my own skin from the environment outside? Right, and also just to jump on that, and what kind of skin, obviously, you know, a whole other kind of conversation that I had. About. Another one. I know, we don't have time, but, you know, you touched on that with essential workers who are our essential workers, you know, um, anyway. Oh, people that feel threatened in different ways right now. I mean, talk about what is happening uh, uh, at all levels with, uh, you know, Asia, uh, hate in places like New York. I mean, you know, I have friends that uh, don't want to get out of the house anymore. I mean, that's really crazy, you know, uh, situation. Uh, so, yeah. Well, complicated. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, audience, for your attention and participation. And um, we look forward to uh, our event next week, which will be the last event of the series, and hope to see some of you there and then eventually to the book. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Thank you very much. Hi, Jennifer.